Okay, well, thank you. Thanks for having me here. Thanks to the organizers. I think this has been a great conference so far. This is joint work with Jesse Shapiro, who's at Brown, and Matt Taddy, who's here at Chicago and also at Microsoft Research. Um, and this is part of, I guess, a, a broader research agenda for us, thinking about political polarization in the US and changes in political polarization in the US. And the particular thing that we're thinking about in this paper is partisan language and partisan speech. Um, so to anybody who's been paying attention to politics in this country, it's clear that people on opposite sides of the political spectrum speak different languages to meaningful degrees. So when Republicans talk about reducing taxes, they like to call that tax relief because that sounds like relieving you of some terrible burden that has been imposed. Democrats like to call those things tax breaks, like we're giving tax breaks to corporations and tax breaks to wealthy people. Um, there are a bunch of examples. You know, a, a more recent thing is, is with, for example, the, the shooting at the nightclub in Orlando that happened a little while back. It was pointed out that within, you know, a day or so after that event, there was this very stark difference if you looked at what Democratic politicians and left-leaning media outlets were saying relative to the reverse, where everybody on the left was calling it a mass shooting, and everybody on the right was calling it a terrorist attack. And those were linking into two very different narratives. One, this is yet another example of gun violence and should lead us to think about gun control and so on. The other, this is, this is a terrorist attack, an example of Obama not keeping us safe. So it, we, we know if something about this kind of language today, and it's clear that it doesn't, at least if we're thinking about politicians in the political debate, it doesn't arise by accident. There's a whole sort of industry of consultants and focus groups that are dedicated to trying to design and choose this kind of language. So these are memos from Frank Luntz, who was maybe the most famous of these political consultants focused on language, particularly in the 90s and early 2000s. So these are memoranda that were sent to congressional candidates from the Republican Party and basically giving very detailed instructions for here is the language you should use when talking about tax cuts, here's the language that you should use when talking about health care. Um, so to give you like a particular example, in a 2006 memo, this is during the George W. Bush presidency when social security reform was one of the signature issues on the table. So Luntz says to Republican candidates, when we're talking about this, you should never call it privatization of social security, which is the main thing that had been called up to that point. Uh, because it turns out that makes people scared and nervous and they think about Russia and Eastern Europe and I don't know, profits and winners and losers, various things. Instead, we should call it personalization, personal accounts. That sounds better, conjures up a better image for people. And in focus groups, they're more likely to support it. Um, and so if you then go and look at the data, you can see that politicians follow this advice. So this is counts of the use of these phrases in, in the 2005 Congress, this Congress around that same debate. And you can see Republicans, to kind of a remarkable degree, get in line behind that advice. I don't know what happened to the five people who said private account. Um, the Democrats <laughs> do the reverse, say private account basically every chance they get. Um, and in thinking about the, the kind of broader importance of this, is this kind of language just some idiosyncratic thing about what politicians do, or does it matter for anything broader that we might care about? It's also clear that from, from other evidence that this kind of language doesn't stay in Congress, but filters down into the media and filters down into the wider public discussion and political debate. So this is just an example to give you the flavor. This is like a particular day, a particular event, news stories about exactly the same event in the Washington Post and the Washington Times, which are a bit to the left and way to the right, I guess, respectively. And they're using this language in the same way that the politicians are. The Washington Post calls it private accounts. Washington Times calls it personal accounts. So the broad, very simple, in a sense, question that we wanted to ask in this paper is, is this a new phenomenon? Is there something new about the way that we are using partisan language today? Or has, is this something that has always been true? We've always had this strategically chosen 
political differences in how we use language. We're just talking about different things in different periods of time. Um, so I think, I think really going to this, we had three hypotheses. One, maybe there's something new. Two, maybe that's sort of been true forever. And the other, which actually I think is what we expected to find, is maybe this is tracking, this is sort of an index of some underlying ideological disagreement. So in periods where ideological divisions are strong in Congress, we'll see big differences in language. In periods where they're smaller, we'll see smaller differences. And so this is just going to be yet another measure of, of some underlying dimension of partisanship. Um, so the goal of this paper is basically to answer that question using data from the congressional record going back to 1873. So we have the full text of all of the speeches that have been given in Congress over that period. So we can look over a long historical period. And then there's a sort of methodological half to this paper which grew out of, we, we thought this was going to be a simple question to answer. This was one of these sort of, what are we going to do with these data? Well, let's first draw this graph of how partisanship has changed over time. You know, we'll do that in the first week and then move on to other things. And then the thing that was supposed to be the first week took, I won't tell you how many years. Um, to do. So the, 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 the issue that we bumped into, which I think once you understand it and, and for the statisticians and you know, other people who used to think about these issues, it's blindingly obvious, but um, the, the speech is an example of data which is very high dimensional. And that means that if, if you think about the question, let's look at how different the choices of two different groups are in that high dimensional space, there's going to be a potential for really severe bias if you do that in a naive way. So I'll talk about that in more detail, but I think the idea you want to have in mind is if you're looking at any choice problem, so this is speech, but it could be what websites do people visit, it could be which UPCs did they buy in the supermarket, um, the, 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 if that vector of possible choices is really long, even if you have a lot of data, there are going to be many, many choices that are chosen few times. And that means if I ask how different are those vectors, how different are the choices of these two groups, and I'm not thinking carefully about those small samples, there are going to be a lot of phrases that are said much more by Republicans or much more by Democrats just by chance. And naive measures are going to kind of be overfit and tend to interpret that as partisanship. Um, and so it turns out to be, take a little bit of work, I think, to address that correctly. The other issue is just this is, it's a, it's a large computational problem. Um, so what we're going to sort of settle on is a simple penalized estimator, basically, of a structural demand model, the way economists would describe it, or just a, a simple choice model. Um, and although I'll be talking about this speech problem here today, I think these are methods that there, it's a template for solving a problem that you could apply to lots of other domains. Web browsing, as I said, thinking about residential segregation in small neighborhoods or for characteristics that we only see in surveys. So um, happy to talk about other things we're thinking about doing with those methods. Um, this relates to a couple of literatures. I think the, 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 there's broad literature and polarization. I think the important things to say about that are that broadly speaking, I think the pattern has been there's a public perception that something is really new and different about the um, politics of the last 10 years or so in the extent to which this country is divided. And the thrust of the academic literature has been to say that's kind of an illusion. And if you look carefully at the data, that's not true. So if you look at Congress, the conclusion is, if you look at things like roll call voting, it's true that partisanship polarization has been going up, but it also used to be very high in the past. So nothing's new. And if you look at stuff in the public, like people's views on issues or measures of, of polarization in the public, the, the, a lot of influential people have argued, basically, there's no sign of any trend. Can you link it to outcomes, like the legislative volume and things like that? Yeah. Can we in this paper? Yes. No. So um, there are huge glaring limitations to this paper. One of them is that we don't have any evidence. The question does, can we measure the effect of speech on other things? We have nothing to say about that in this paper. That's an important question. I think a very hard question. Even more broadly, there's a question, why do we care? about any of this, which I think we have only the most hand wavy sort of general, you know, thoughts on that, but, but nothing that's going to convince a skeptic. So those are, this is really a descriptive paper 
that is all that we are going to tell you is how has the extent to which Democrats and Republicans talk differently changed over time, period. Okay. But so as background, I think that's what you would take away from this literature is noth broadly nothing is really new. And so I think that's important as background for what we're going to find and, and thinking about, you know, is there, is there anywhere we can see in the data evidence consistent with this perception that something really has changed in a big way. Um, the other thing to say is there are, there are other papers that are looking specifically at congressional speech, and there's one paper in particular, um, actually a couple now that have come out, but one in particular that was published in Brookings in 2012 by Ethan Kaplan and Suresh Naidu and, and co-authors, that's almost, it's like using the same data and asking the same question, um, and differs from our paper mainly just in what do they find at the end of the day, what is the conclusion, and I'll talk about why our conclusion differs from theirs. So, as I said, we're going to use this text from the congressional record. This is, there's a law that says there must be published a verbatim speech of everything that is said on the floor of Congress. These are those books which we have digitized. Then we're going to do some kind of standard stuff to um, try to parse those to figure out what is a speech and for each speech to sort of back out from the text who is speaking and match those, person, those people to their parties and so on. We're, we're going to remove stop words and stem words to sort of standard text processing steps. That's good to keep in mind just because when I show you lists of phrases, they're going to be in that form. Um, and so they'll look a little funny. You have to kind of invert back out in your head that war terror means war on terrorism, war on terror, things like that. Just a, a background fact to have in mind, which is related to bias once we start talking about it, is the amount that people speak in Congress has changed a lot over time. And it actually changed a lot in a very short period. And I don't know, we have not yet been able to figure out a convincing answer to why th that change happens so much right in this period. But broadly, there's a, a big upward trend in the quantity of speech. And that's going to matter a lot for what these naive estimates look like. OK, so I want to come at this from the sort of economist side of we're going to start basically from a generative model to think about um, how we want to think about speech. And that the basic model is one that's very standard in the literature on, on in machine learning and dealing with text, but is sort of a crazy model if you were thinking about language, um, actual language, which is we'll, we will think of all of the speech that we see as independent draws from a multinomial distribution. So each phrase that I say is a, is a new IID draw from some distribution of probabilities uh, that are specific to each person in each time. Um, so I'm just taking repeated IID draws. So if, I was, if that was the way I was actually talking right now, it would be maybe even less comprehensible what I'm saying. But that turns out to be, you know, in the, the, if the purpose is prediction, this kind of model captures a lot of the relevant information. So what we're going to observe for each person in each year is a vector of counts C. So th the number of elements in that vector is the, is the size of the vocabulary. So there's one entry for every possible phrase that you might have said. So that's on the order of a million entries, say. Each person has a party affiliation. Forget about third parties. We'll throw them out. Each person has some vector of observable characteristics x. We'll let m denote the total number of things that a person says in a particular year. And then we're going to assume that C comes from this multinomial distribution where you took M draws from multinomial probability Q, where Q depends on your party, depends on the year, and depends on those observable characteristics. And then framed that way, we can be a little more precise about what we mean. How, how has the extent to which Republicans and Democrats speak different languages changed over time? The way descriptively we're going to define that question is how different are these two vectors of the true underlying choice probabilities, and how has that distance between them changed over time? Um, so, so broadly, that's what we have in mind, is just how different are the propensities to speak. Of course, there are many, many metrics you could put on how, how different are these two vectors. You could think about just take the Euclidean distance between them. You could think um, we, an advantage of sort of ha this underlying model is we're, it's going to give us a particular metric that we think is nice because it has some interpretability, which is what is the probability that a neutral observer who gets to see some fixed amount of speech could correctly guess somebody's party? Um, so if I say, imagine I've drawn, a ran I've drawn a congressperson who might be Republican or Democrat with probability 0.5, you're going to get to hear them say one phrase, say, 
what is the expected posterior that you would assign to their true party. That's, that's the metric we're going to use. It, it, that, that has some nice properties, but you should basically have in mind the patterns I'm going to show you are the same for any metric of distance. So, so Euclidean distance is one. Another is th this question of how, how different are these things is the question that the literature on residential segregation asks. I have a vector of where black people live and where white people live, and I'm trying to characterize to what extent do they live in different places. And so you could apply standard segregation measures and get similar answers to. So what does that mean exactly? Well, take some phrase J. If I have a 50-50 prior and I hear you say one thing that turns out to be phrase J, my posterior is just the ratio, the probability that a Republican said it to the overall probability that it was said. That's just Bayes' rule. And then our measure of partisanship is going to be the expectation of the row that you, uh, of the posterior you assign to a speaker's true party. So if, if they turned out to be a Republican, which happens with probability 0.5, that is across all of the different phrases they might have said, weighted by those probabilities, your posterior probability that they're a Republican. If they turn out to be a Democrat, it's the same thing using the Democrats probabilities, and this is your posterior that they're a Democrat. So this is just a measure of how likely you are to assign probability weight to their true party. And then the, the main measure I'm going to show you, this thing depends on x, these observables, and I'm just going to average that across speakers, uh, across the x's of speakers within a given session to get an overall measure uh, for each year. Okay, so this is a very simple model. Seems like a very straightforward estimation problem in some sense. Just we just need to know these rows for each phrase, and then we can plug them in. Um, I mean, we need to know the cues to know the rows, and then we can plug them in um, to, to compute partisanship. It, it seems pretty straightforward. To somebody who's not used to thinking in high dimensional sort of machine learning land, um, the, the, the natural thing to do might be just a plug-in estimator where you use the empirical analogs of those things to compute this estimate. So we have an empirical analog for each phrase of the cues, which is just what share of the times that it was said, was it said by Republicans, say, or what share of the things that Republicans said were that phrase, rather. Rho, which is plugging those in to the what share of the times phrase J was said, was it said by Republicans, and then we could plug those in to our overall measure. This is the maximum likelihood estimator for this model, so that would seem to make it nice. And in what sense does it have lots of nice properties? It has lots of nice properties asymptotically as the amount of speech you see goes big. And in particular, as that happens holding fixed the vocabulary. So for each phrase, I've gotten to see it said many, 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 many times. And so I'm going to have a consistent estimate for each of these things. So if that was the world we were in, if the number of possible phrases was small relative to the amount of speech, this would be fine. Turns out not to be so fine in, in the actual setting. Um, but if you forget about that, suppose I, you didn't realize that there, there was that issue, and you just compute this, what do you see? This is that maximum likelihood estimator over time. Um, and so we spent, I won't tell you how much time looking at this, thinking how interesting it was. Um, you know, indeed, there has been some up, uptick in recent years, but partisanship was actually way higher in the past than it is today. Um, and then, the, the, it occurred to us at some point, among the useful sort of checks to make sure that we're doing everything right, is let's go through the data and randomly reassign all of the party labels. Let's just like randomly rescramble who's a Democrat and who's a Republican. We know based on the model that the truth then is partisanship equals 0.5, because if I've randomly reassigned the labels, I can't tell those labels from your speech. So if we're doing things correctly, this for the random series should be like a, a flat line at 0.5. That seemed like a good check, and we did it, and we got this. Um, at which point we thought this is not maybe working as well as we had hoped. So this is that same MLE just from data with random party labels. And you see it tracks it almost perfectly. Um, what does that mean? That basically tells you that, that what all of these dynamics are driven by is some sampling variability and some bias in this estimator that's, that's varying over time. And it turns out you can show analytically basically that 
almost all of this dynamics is coming from dynamics in the just total verbosity, the total amount of speech. Um, without, we don't have a lot of time, so I don't want to spend a lot of time at this, but how can you think about why there is a bias here and why it's systematically in one direction toward the, basically the smaller your sample, the more partisan does the speech look? As I said, I think the simplest heuristic for that is just you'll see a lot of phrases that are said by one side or the other just by chance. Another way to think about it is suppose the truth was the Q vector is exactly the same for Republicans and Democrats as it is in the random data, then the, the truth I want to, the, the truth is the distance between these two vectors is zero, but any sampling variability is going to cause that diff diff distance to be greater than zero. Third way to think about it, uh, which is going to be useful to, for something I'm going to show you in a sec, is the, the key term in this partisanship is the product of these Qs and these rows, right? Q is the probability that a Republican says this phrase, and rho is my posterior if they say that phrase. Rho is a monotonically, like rho hat is a monotonically increasing function of Q hat. So I, I, I'm putting in the product of two things that both contain the same epsilons, and so the expectation of that product is going to tend to be positive. Um, so that's really kind of mechanically why this bias is so huge, because it's just, we're just taking this product of, of, of the same epsilons, basically. So the variance, we're putting into the measure the variance of the errors. Um, okay, so you, you might think this is just a good example of how little we knew. Uh, I mean, it probably is a good example of how little we know. But in terms of whether it's an important thing, it's useful to note that in this previous literature, I think there's some of the same issue floating around. So this is the published result from that Jensen et al. paper I mentioned. Basically, same data. This is their measure, um, not our measure. And if we, we took their, they were kind enough to share their data. So with their data, we can do the same exercise of randomly reassigning party labels. And this is the, the placebo series on their data. And so I think what that shows is that in their case, their big conclusion was the partisanship of speech tracks overall ideological Polarization is measured in other ways. It has been increasing recently, but it used to be as high or higher in the past. And I think this suggests that the second half of that, it used to be as high as or higher in the past, is really an artifact of this small sample bias. Um, and you can see both in this picture and in this picture a hint of what the actual answer to the question is going to be, which is where do these series diverge? It's just in very recent years that we see them starting to diverge systematically. And you can see that in in the MLE, you can see that in their measure as well. Um, okay, so you know the, the rest of the work in this paper is just what do you do about that? How do you get to something um, which is going to solve that problem and help us see the right answer to this question? Uh, a really obvious thing you might do is say, well, let's just restrict the vocabulary. To the whole problem is there are all these phrases floating around that get said once or twice or three times. What about just forget about those phrases? Let's focus on the subset of the vocabulary where we have a lot of data. Um, and so this is what happens if you do that. And, and you could just focus on, like, for example, here is what happens if we take just the top 1% of phrases by how much they're said. And as you would expect, that reduces the magnitude of the bias. So the gray line here is getting flatter as we move down. Uh, this is throwing out more data, showing it to you by percents. This is by the total number of times something is said, we're reducing the bias. But also, there's a lot of noise in the remaining series. We're, we're, we're kind of creating a lot of noise in the meantime. And that's intuitive, because we're throwing out most of our data. So if we go, if we go all the way down to here, we're throwing out 99% of the data. If we go here, we're throwing out more than 99% of the data. And so that is an effective way to control bias, but it introduces a lot of variance. And so we're losing a lot of the signal when we do that. And we, so, so we'd like to think of a more efficient way that's going to keep, keep the data but still allow us to control this issue. Um, in the end, we're going to suggest two things to do. The main one, which I'll tell you about in a second. And prior to that, we wanted to think about what is a model, what is a model free way to look at the data that doesn't require a lot of estimation steps, that just is there a, a lens through which we can look at the data that gets rid of this problem um, just and lets us look at it descriptively. So a way to do that, it comes back to the talk yesterday about sample splitting. 
remember the whole product is the epsilons in these Qs and the epsilons in the rows are the same epsilons and so they're correlated. So an intuitive thing you might do is just split the sample in half, estimate the Qs from one half, estimate the rows from the other half, and that would give you up to some minor issues, something like an unbiased estimator. We're going to do something which is basically that, but slightly more efficient, which is you can write this as a sum over individuals of the same term. And then for each individual, we'll compute your Qs based on your data and compute the rows from the data of everybody other than you in the sample. And then kind of rotate around all the different individuals with different leave out samples. That's going to use more of the data and be a little bit more efficient. So this is going to be, there's still some minor reasons it's, this is not quite unbiased, but as we'll see, it's going to be much closer. Um, so this is that leave out estimator. You see now that we're controlling this bias basically completely. There's still a lot of noise. This is again a, a, an inefficient use of the data, but so even the random series you can see has a lot of noise and there's a lot of noise in the pink line consistent with that. Um, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to get us pretty close. And then what is our preferred estimator um, is going to basically uh, start from that multinomial model, control this bias by using L1 lasso penalties on those parameters. Um, so that's going to shrink the coefficient estimates toward one and deal with this bias. That is also going to let us put in covariates which this leave out estimator does not let us do. So in particular, thinking about American politics over this period of time, something you might worry about a lot is regional differences in the alignments of the parties. So North versus South in the US is a big divide that's changed a lot over time. So we're able to put in basically each phrase has a loading on region that varies freely over time. So kind of take out everything that has to do with regions and get the, 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 the partisan dimension that's orthogonal to that. Um, and then for computation, the other thing we're going to do, and this also relates back to um, like what David was talking about yesterday, uh, this is basically, we basically want to estimate a logit model here with on the order of a million choices. That seems hard computationally, and it is hard computationally if you try to directly estimate that model. So we're going to use that same Poisson factorization result and approximate the logit by a Poisson model. The, the, the key advantage of that, so, so the logit model says each phrase comes from this multinomial draw, so if I choose to say death tax, that makes me less likely to say everything else. The Poisson model says each phrase is just an independent Poisson arrival process. Why is that really helpful? It's helpful because now I can estimate the parameters corresponding to each phrase independently without knowing anything about the other phrases. Okay? So putting things into that main estimation framework, then this is the main result. So you can see the same kind of overall qualitative pattern, but this regularization and the inclusion of those covariates smooths out a lot of noise. So that now you can see like this placebo series, the, the variance in it is sort of a good eyeball test for how much sampling variability is there in the data. Um, and then you can see that you know, partisanship has gone up and down over time, but the magnitude of that is very small relative to this huge increase that's happened in recent years. And that huge increase happened very discreetly in basically the, the 1994 Congress is the beginning of that takeoff. Um, now, one, one question first is how big is the magnitude of this? So remember the units of our measure, the way we've defined it is, what is the chance you could guess somebody's party if they said one phrase? They might have said, good morning, in which case you can't guess very well. So those numbers are all pretty close to 0.5. Is this a big change, a small change, sort of hard to tell. So a nice feature of having the estimated model is we can then es we can compute, given the estimates, the analog of this measure for any quantity of speech. Say, well, what's the chance I could guess your party if you said 10 phrases or 100 phrases or 1,000 phrases? Um, so this is what that looks like across different numbers of phrases that you might have said. Um, and so a one minute speech falls about here. So if you think, how much could I learn from hearing you speak for one minute? That um, in the 1800s, all the way up to about 1990, the chance that I could guess somebody's party 
from hearing a minute of speech was a bit less than 55%. And that's increased from there to 2000, 2000, 2007, 8, up to about 83%. So that's one way to think about the magnitude of this change. In a sense, that makes it seem pretty big. Um, th this is coming back to the question, is this basically another index of overall partisanship? So the standard measure of how ideologically divided is Congress is this measure from Poole and Rosenthal based on roll call votes. So this takes all of the roll call votes, embeds them in a latent space, looks at how different, how far apart are the Republicans and the Democrats. And this is kind of the classic result, which is that yes, partisanship is going up, going up, but it's just returning to the very high levels that we saw earlier. And you can see that basically speech looks very different from that. The pattern of speech is very different. Um, and so we think this isn't just, it doesn't look like this is picking up that same dimension. It's something very different and very specific to speech. Let me, in the interest of time, I'm going to sort of show you a subset of the results on trying to unpack what's under the hood. So the question for the remainder of the paper is, so what the heck happened in 1994, and where is this big change coming from? Um, we can do a few things. One thing that's sort of useful is just to look at what are the most partisan phrases in each year, just to kind of have a feel for how things are changing. And so again, the model gives you a nice way to um, think about what is a partisan phrase. It's actually a little bit related to loco that we were talking about yesterday. And the question is just, if I removed one of those phrases from the vocabulary, how much would my predictive ability fall? And so we can compute that for each phrase. Given the holding fixed the estimates, how much would each phrase reduce the predictive power of speech? And, and think of that as a measure of partisanship. Um, I'm not going to take the time to go through lots of these, but um, you can look at the lists of what are the most partisan phrases in each Congress can line those up with the party platforms in those years. So even though my knowledge of US history is not so good, not good enough to really know what these things are, it turns out that they line up pretty closely with what the platforms said were the key divisions. So this is like the Republican platform is all about compensation for veterans of recent wars. And you see the Republicans are talking about war. The Democrats are trying to get rid of trusts and um, kind of bust big business. And there are a bunch of things that are related to that. A general feature as you flip through these, this is like the 1940s, this is the 1980s, is that they're almost all different. Up until this point, they're almost all differences in what they're talking about. They're differences in topics, differences in subjects. So like in the 1940s, the Republicans are talking about defense. The Democrats are talking about labor regulation. And that's where the predictive power is going to come from. Um, just qualitatively, you see this is the first Congress after that big spike. And suddenly, there's much more of this. We're talking about the same thing using different language, just as a sort of totally subjective observation. Um, can look at new phrases. Let me come to this topic decomposition, say, how much of this then is differences in which topics you talk about and how much is differences in how you talk about them? There are, there are a bunch of ways that you could try to do that, including we've spent a fair bit of time trying to do that with various automated methods and think about fitting topic models and using that to decompose. Um, what we've ended up with, just for a variety of reasons, is a kind of manual classification where we've gone through some iterated manual algorithm to classify phrases into what we started out with as a list of, of kind of the key topics. So think about we've manually grouped phrases into these categories. Then something, something nice that we can do is, given the model, we can ask how much of the polarization is within versus between. Within here means how well could I guess your party conditional on you have to just talk about labor. And between means how well could I guess your party if all I get to see is which topic you were talking in, but not which phrases you used, used to talk about it. So this is that series. This is the pink line is the baseline. Black is within, the blue is between. So you can see most of the change that we're seeing, though not all, is happening within topics and how they're being talked about, not with increasing divergence in which topics the parties are emphasizing. Um, you can look at particular topics. Not everything is more partisan recently. So this is phrases about alcohol. When were those really partisan in the 1930s? So this is the frequency with which things are talked about, and this is their partisanship by our measure. So you see alcohol was partisan then. 
Um, just kind of flipping forward, these are the things that see big increases in recent years. So where is that big spike coming from? It's coming from taxes, immigration, healthcare, size of government stuff, crime, and budget out appropriations kind of phrases. Um, okay, so last minute or so, um, what do we think is going on, given that pattern of results? Again, the, the incredibly unsatisfying, I guess a third incredibly unsatisfying thing about this paper. One, we have no causal effects. Two, it's not clear why it matters. Three, we can't really tell you definitively what happened. Um, <laughs> but we can raise, kind of wave our hands and speculate about it. And I think in this case, the fact that that change is so sharp in that one year points you toward a particular set of explanations. So the, the year that this huge break in that series happens is not a random year. It's 1994. This was the year that Republicans took back control of Congress for the first time since 1952. It was the Newt Gingrich as Speaker of the House election, the election in which the Republicans ran under something called the Contract with America. And that is viewed as a watershed election in US politics that really changed Congress and politics in a bunch of ways. And the central one, according to the narrative evidence, is that the, basically the innovation, think of this as like a technological innovation in political rhetoric. Direct focus on choice of language as a tool. So Frank Luntz, who we talked about at the beginning, became famous in this election. He was the pollster for Newt Gingrich who introduced a lot of this kind of language. Frank Luntz was asked retrospectively later, do you believe that language can change a paradigm? I don't believe it. I know it. I've seen it with my own eyes. I watched in 1994 when Republicans got together and said, we're going to do this completely differently than it's ever been done before. Everybody used to call their thing a platform. We decided to call it a contract. More generally, we put this focus on language and that, that really worked. George Lakoff, who's a linguist at Berkeley, who kind of has been a leader in thinking about language on the Democratic side, um, echoes that sentiment. And so there, we talk about it in the paper, right? there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that, that this is something like an, a, a real technological innovation in rhetoric. Um, we can't, as I said, prove that. One thing we can do is take the contract with America, document, collect all of the phrases that appear in that document and treat that as a topic and say, well, what about partisanship within those phrases? That's this graph and you can see there's a spike in their usage in that year, as you might expect and there's a big takeoff in their partisanship. So certainly those phrases are playing some significant role in this change. Um, coming back to Lars's question, what else was changing over that period? One, I think there's a broader trend toward party discipline within Congress that begins even before the Republican takeover of Congress. The other is there were big changes in media that were very important for this. Prior to sort of the, the early 1980s, Television cameras were allowed into Congress only very rarely for like the McCarthy hearings or something. Um, starting in the early 80s, you had the launch of C-SPAN cable network and with that TV cameras in Congress all the time. So everything that is said on the floor of Congress is recorded and broadcast live on C-SPAN. We think that does not matter directly in the sense that nobody watches C-SPAN. So, the hypothesis that this is all being driven by these guys thinking about the audience back home watching C-SPAN I think is not very compelling, but it means that there's a, a record on video of everything you said. And that means it's gonna get rebroadcast on the nightly news and used by your opponents in commercials and stuff. So it's easy to see how that would change your um, incentives in thinking about what to say and push you toward these sort of sound bites and choosing things carefully. So, you know, just circumstantially, it doesn't look like those events correspond, coincide with this big takeoff in this time series. This is just zooming in on the plot I showed you earlier of our main measure. It really looks like the contract with America is the proximate cause, but we think of these as complementary developments in some sense, um, that the, that, that technological innovation was more effective, more likely, more successful in a world with those TV cameras than not. So those things potentially complemented each other. Um, okay, so, I think there's, there's circumstantial evidence to explain what happened. I do think this is one of the first places we really see pictures that suggest something very different in terms of polarization and partisanship 
than has ever been true historically. Um, and so then coming back to Costas's question, coming back to the obvious question, who cares? Um, you know, here we're just waving our hands, but I think th there are some things we know. We know that this kind of language, once created, does not stay in Congress, but is used systematically by media outlets, systematically and extensively by media outlets, and also is used in the broader public discussion on Wikipedia, on Twitter, on Facebook. People use this language when they talk. We know from sort of laboratory type studies that if you use this language, it affects people's reported opinions about things. That's why the politicians are using it, because they did those studies. And we know from a much broader literature that language in general matters a lot for group identity. And that if people speak different languages, that's going to tend to reinforce their in-group feelings. It's going to create more distance from out-groups and can have big effects on how people perceive the social world. Um, so we think it's at least plausible that if, if we've moved to a situation where much more than in the past people on opposite sides of the political spectrum speak different languages, that may be contributing to and reinforcing divisions more broadly and limiting the extent to which we can communicate with each other. Okay, thank you.